Okay, I've got myself a little bit of quiet time and I'm well rested up enough to where I can continue where I left off. Now regarding this whole thing about guns rights and who's allowed to keep and bear arms and uh, the government's coming to get your guns and all this other nonsense, we're going to um, focus on a very important clause that seems to be the basis for support for the reason why a lot of these people feel so adamantly strong and just unrelenting when it relates to this thing about who has the right to own what weapons and what kind of weapons and what the purpose for owning such weapons are etc and so forth well we're going to get right straight to the heat of the matter here and the biggest thing that just keeps coming up as far as our supposed right to keep and bear firearms as I tried to explain earlier it seems to be based on the second amendment of the constitution the um, article in the Bill of Rights known as the right to keep and bear arms. Now keep this in mind because as I pointed out earlier, first and foremost, the Second Amendment says jack nothing about the right to keep and bear firearms. That's very important to remember. It says nothing about keeping and bearing firearms. Was that implied? Of course it was implied. No, let's not you know pretend to be brickish here. We understand what they meant when they said that. But again, constitutional language is very deliberately careful for a reason and I have to believe that also this was one of the reasons why it was careful in not specifying firearms because as stated earlier anything that can be used as a weapon can be constituted as an armament so that we're clear on that but let's examine this second amendment clause a whole lot more closely because these gun waving nuts out there who are always scared that government's gonna come get your guns they always rally to this little um, uh, secondary clause in the Second Amendment, which states that the right of the citizens to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. But if you ever notice, at least the ones who are honest about it, whenever they quote this, especially in text, they usually proceed it with three little dots, which means that something comes before that. Now, as I explained earlier, the Second Amendment of the Constitution is the only constitutional guarantee which comes with a condition. And what is the condition? A well-regulated militia being necessary. That's the condition for your right to keep and bear arms that shall not be infringed. It's all the basis on the formation of not a militia. Now keep that in mind also. They always like to throw this around, form your militias, form your militias. Uh, because you know we have to have our militias, then we need to keep and bear our arms. That's not what it says. It says a well-regulated militia. There's that word regulated. Who regulates things in our society? Hmm? Speak up. I can't hear you. That's right. The good old federal government. So in order for the militia to be deemed legitimate, it has to come under the authority of the governmental powers. Hence, the well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state. There's that word state again government so government regulates the militia a militia isn't just some haphazard collection of a bunch of people who got together and decided to form a little uh, neighborhood watch army or any such thing it has to come under somebody's jurisdiction and when it comes under somebody's jurisdiction that means that the government has the power and the authority to both form militias and whenever necessary to call up and activate the militias now, do we have a well-regulated militia today in the United States of America? Yes, we do. In fact, we have always had a well-regulated militia. During the times of our history when we did not have a standing army, or when it was much smaller and less of a militaristic force than it is today, we had a reliable standby which, whenever given the call for activation, the government could send out the word and the well-regulated militia will come to the fore to defend the free state. They were originally known as the Minutemen, and the Minutemen still exist to this very day, and they still fall under the guidelines and under the authority of the government, which well regulates them. Now we're going to go through all the constitutional clauses and congressional acts, which identify who and what the well-regulated militia is, and under what conditions they are called to service by the regulating authority. And for this, I'll be reading from a prepared text on an official website. Beginning reading. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15. 
Clause 15 provides that Congress has three constitutional grounds for calling up the militia, quote, to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrection, and to repel invasions, unquote. All three standards appear to be applicable only in the territory of the United States. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 16. Congress may, quote, organize, arm, and discipline, unquote, the militia. The states may, quote, establish, appoint the officers of, and train the militia, unquote. Clause 16 gives Congress the power, quote, to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, and for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States, unquote. That same clause specifically reserves to the states the authority to establish a state-based militia to appoint the officers and to train the militia according to the discipline prescribed by the Congress. Article 1, Section 10, quote, No state may keep troops without the consent of Congress, unquote. Article 1, Section 10 provides that no state without the consent of Congress shall keep troops or ships of war in a time of peace or engage in war unless actually invaded. Hence, the Second Amendment, quote, a well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, unquote. The Second Amendment qualified Article 1, Section 10 by ensuring that federal government could not disarm the state militias. Article 4, Section 4 provides that federal government, quote, shall guarantee to every state in this union a Republican form of government, unquote, and shall protect each of the states against invasion. At state request, the federal government was to protect the states, quote, against domestic violence, unquote. Through these provisions, the potential for both cooperative federalism and for tension between the militia and the army clauses was built into the Constitution. Article 2, Section 2 makes the President of the United States Commander-in-Chief of all forces, including the militia when federalized. Article 1, Section 8 gives Congress the ultimate control through its sole power to collect taxes, to pay the military, to declare war, and to employ the militia for security. Existing state militias could be maintained, although troops could be called into national service, but the Founding Fathers moderated that authority by leaving the individual states with the explicit responsibility for appointing officers and for supervising peacetime training of the citizen soldiers. The Military Act of 1792 subsequently expanded federal policy and clarified the role of the militia. It required all able-bodied men aged 18 to 45 to serve, to be armed, to be equipped at their own expense, and to participate in annual musters. The 1792 Act established the idea of organizing these militia forces into standard divisions, brigades, regiments, battalions, and companies as directed by the state legislatures. For the 111 years that the Militia Act of 1792 remained in effect, it defined the position of the militia in relation to the federal government. The War of 1812 tested this unique American defense establishment. To fight the War of 1812, the Republic formed a small regular military and trained it to protect the frontiers and coastlines. Although it performed poorly in the offensive against Canada, the small force of regulars, backed by well-armed militia, accomplished its defensive mission well. Generals like Andrew Jackson proved, just as they had in the Revolution, that regulars and militia could be effective when employed as a team. Posse Comitatus Congress's suspension of southern states' rights to organize a militia resulted in Posse Comitatus, a limiting of the President's use of military forces in peacetime. In 1867, the Congress suspended the southern states' right to organize their militia until the state was firmly under the control of an acceptable government. The U.S. Army was used to enforce martial law in the South during Reconstruction. Expansion of the military's role in domestic life, however, did not occur without debate or response. Reaction to the use of the Army in suppressing labor unrest in the North and guarding polls in the South during the 1876 election 
led to congressional enactment of the Posse Comitatus Act in 1878. Designed to limit the President's use of military forces in peacetime, this statute provided that, quote, it shall not be lawful to employ any part of the Army of the United States for the purpose of executing the laws, except on such cases and under such circumstances as such employment of said force may be expressly authorized by the Constitution or by an act of Congress." Unquote. The states revised the military codes, 1881 to 1892. Concern over the militia's new domestic role also led the states to re-examine their need for a well-equipped and well-trained militia, and between 1881 and 1892, Every state revised the military code to provide for an organized force. Most changed the name of their militia to the National Guard, following New York's example. Between 1903 and the 1920s, legislation was enacted that strengthened the Army National Guard as a component of the National Defense Force. The Dick Act of 1903 replaced the 1792 Militia Act and affirmed the National Guard as the Army's primary organized reserve. The National Defense Act of 1916 further expanded the Guard's role and guaranteed the state militia's status as the Army's primary reserve force. Furthermore, the law mandated use of the term National Guard for that force. Moreover, the President was given authority in case of war or national emergency to mobilize the National Guard for the duration of the emergency. The number of yearly drills increased from 24 to 48, and annual training from 5 to 15 days. Drill pay was authorized for the first time. The National Defense Act amendments of 1920 put the National Guard on the general staff. The National Guard Act amendments of 1920 established that the chief of the Militia Bureau, later the National Guard Bureau, would be a National Guard officer that National Guard officers would be assigned to the general staff and that the divisions as used by the Guard in World War I would be reorganized. National Guard Status Act of 1933 made the National Guard a component of the Army. Henceforward, every Guard member would have two statutes, though he or she could only serve in one status at a given time. A Guard member could either serve under state authority as part of the National Guard of the several states, territories, and the District of Columbia, or under federal authority in the National Guard of the United States when ordered into active federal service by the President whenever Congress declared a national emergency. The total force policy of 1973 requires all active and reserve military organizations to be treated as a single integral force, reinforced the original intent of the Founding Fathers, a small standing army complemented by citizen soldiers. Following the experience of fighting an unpopular war in Vietnam, the 1973 total force policy was designed to involve a large portion of the American public by mobilizing the National Guard from its thousands of locations throughout the United States when needed. The total force policy required that all active and reserve military organizations of the United States be treated as a single integrated force. A related benefit of this approach is to permit elected officials to have a better sense of public support or opposition to any major military operation. This policy echoes the original intentions of the Founding Fathers for a small standing army complemented by citizen soldiers. Now that was a very tough reading for me to get through in one sitting because I'm just jack tired and my eyes aren't working properly right now. But essentially in a nutshell, we have had a well-regulated militia from the very beginning, from the days when they were known as the Minutemen up to the present day as the National Guard. So there exists your well-regulated militia. Now, the idea of whether or not because someone is a part of that well-regulated militia that they should just have access to their own weapons free and clear, again, that's an argument I'm not ready to have and I could really care one way or the other what anybody's personal opinion is about that. But understand that there is absolutely nothing in the Constitution that guarantees that each and every individual in the United States of America is authorized to tote around an M80 or whatever fits their fancy at the time. If that's what you want, then go the legal route, call for a constitutional convention which specifically states that the citizenry shall own firearms, whether they belong to a militia or not but to use the clause in the Second Amendment as your justification as to how the Constitution guarantees each and every one of us the right to keep and bear arms, 
then you're really grabbing at straws. And again, remember, even if you use the Second Amendment as your convenient go-to excuse, it doesn't say anything about firearms. So that's my rant and my history lesson for the week. End of line.